You go on a walk and you see an old man sitting in the park and you just, wow, what's he lived in his lifetime? The things he's seen, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Our culture is about youth and vibrancy and you know excitement and uh, new ideas and that's that's great but i really like that this film shows you an entire character's life in the first 20 minutes and then it brings you to where he is at 78 years old and that's got an incredible amount of depth to it i had done a drawing of a guy a grouchy old guy uh, holding a bunch of really happy, fun, colorful balloons. And it just seemed like a great sort of juxtaposition of such happy colors with kind of guy. And so out of that, you know, we thought there was something there. So we just started developing a story from that. In a way, someone Carl's age is the perfect character for one of these films because it's all about stories. Carl's loaded with stories. His whole life is this amazing story. We basically studied old men and their anatomy, and we, we had tons of books, and, and we actually even went to an old folks home and, and just kind of quietly observed everyone. And, and you have to have a respect for aging because it's an accomplishment. <laughs> Working with Ricky Nirva, our lead artist, we developed a vocabulary, and Carl is all about squares and boxes, and he's very solid, very stuck in his ways. We wanted him boxed in. He's boxed inside his house, he stays within his walls, so we created a character that essentially is a square. And he's very caricatured. He's probably one of the most caricatured humans we've ever designed and or animated. His head is one third of his body. I have a big head. His head is like five times bigger than my head. We wanted to create an essence of an old man. With age comes storytelling in every line and every single pore. And we studied how elastic their faces are. Really, what are the most important wrinkles on the face? There's the nasal labial fold and the accessory jugal fold. The crow's feet are important. The stuff on the forehead are important. All the other things we just shaded in to make sure that we can get age in there. You know, you tend to kind of animate things you're familiar with, and I think we've got a pretty fairly young crew so we've got to really observe our grandparents and observe what happens to us as we age. There's a limitation to the way old people move. It still feels a little like sort of active uh, yeah. at the very beginning. It does feel kind of quick in there when he leans, mm -hmm. when he gets back into place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carl's really about minimal movement, minimal expressions. <laughs> My first instinct was to do the same stuff I do with Woody, which is a lot of overlap and follow through with fingers, because that's what makes the shots look beautiful and loose. And then I got in there and realized that's not the way Carl would move. He's old arthritic. He wouldn't be able to fluidly move his fingers like this, because being an old man, you start to stiffen up. When he turned, he would have to turn like this instead of turning like this. And just doing that makes him feel that much older. Yes, there are a lot of limitations on this character, but that is going to free you up to make those, those new sort of fresh choices with the acting and the way he moves. I was trying to find ways to, to either think of my own grandparents or um, to look at old films and find mannerisms that were of that generation. I didn't want to be a young person putting our own contemporary physical expressions onto the character. So we'd always try to think of what were things our grandparents would do? How would they act something out? Adventures out there. <laughs> it's really him. <laughs> That's Charles Munch. It is. Who's Charles Munch? Munch and Carl both want the same thing. They want Kevin. Carl wants it so that he can set it free and gain Russell's trust and friendship. Munch wants it so he can have fame and adulation and go back to New York and be back at the top of his game. So, of course, they're gonna have to come to loggerheads and fight over that at some point. And just the two of them fighting, uh, I think the idea of those things in contrast is so funny. Uh, and the animators did such a good job with the physics of it that, you know, when Munson and Carl get their back stuck, 
You just buy in, and it's so funny because it's so believable. Make it as funny and specific and unique as you can. We've all seen plenty of action fights. How would it be if a 90-year-old man and a 78-year-old man are fighting, right? What are the things they have to deal with? Any last words, Fredrickson? Come on, spit it out! And then there was also the other school of thought, which is, how do we keep this serious and feel like there are actual stakes, that it's not just a joke, that they're all gonna laugh and go home and nothing bad's gonna happen? It's gotta do both of those. <laughs>The closest relationship he has to any person is with his dogs. He's got, he's, a, he's like the crazy cat lady only with dogs. He's got 50 dogs all around and they've probably been, he's been breeding them and keeping new dogs coming and so he's trained them, you know, they're his wait staff, they're, they fly his planes for him, they do everything for this guy. He's an old guy who comes from another era where the dog is there to serve him. Oh, Epsilon, you've done it again. Our dogs don't speak uh, with their mouths. The dogs in Up have these special collars that were designed by, you know, uh, C.F. Muntz, the famous inventor. So they have speakers on them that speak their thoughts. He is a good and smart master, and he made me this collar so that I may talk. Squirrel! We didn't want it to be a cartoon dog. We wanted it to be uh, a real dog, just that it happens to have this technology. There you go, big fella. Thank you, master. One thing everybody does, it seems like, is they sit and make up lines for their dogs. Like, you know, here comes the dog to the table. Are you going to eat that? You know, it's just, that's what dogs talk about. That's what they think about. Go get it! Oh, boy! Oh, boy! I will get it and then bring it back! These are actual dogs. We think of them as they are going to behave like dogs. They're going to do all the, the uh, little nuances that dogs do, but then they, the voice coming out just ties in with the behavior. So it's matching real dog behaviors with what the voice is. Dog behavior is all about the body language. So we just looked at a lot of dogs. Uh, we had a dog behavior expert come in. Everyone says, oh, tail wag means happy dog, right? Uh, wrong. <laughs> Can be. Um, a happy dog wag is high amplitude, high frequency. You know. With Ian Dunbar, we learned a lot about canine hierarchy, which went a long way to establish the different roles our dogs played in the film. That a lot of people think the doggy hierarchy is a dominance hierarchy, that hierarchy is maintained by lower ranking individuals taking the time to proactively say, hey, 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 I am no threat, guys, I'm no threat. When dogs want to show that they're low ranking or they are appeasing and friendly, definitely the tongue will come out and then getting small, raising the paw, and then rolling over like this and exposing the inguinal area. Sometimes if, you know, Alpha was going towards Doug, he might cower in a very specific submissive way. <laughs> And so a dog displaying these um, appeasing or low ranking signals is really important because this is what leads to uh, stabilization and harmony in the group of dogs. The second master finds out you sent Doug out by himself, none of us will get a treat. <laughs> dogs have all these different uh, means of expression than humans. like. We have eyebrows, dogs have ears. Their dog, their ears will go back or up. We tried to use the ears to give us another acting key that we would normally maybe get from some of the emoting we would do on the face. If a dog was curious, you know, you kind of point the ears 
forward and with Doug he was kind of shying away. It'd be drop the ears and tuck him back a little bit to make him look a little more bashful. Put him in the cone of shame. One of the thrills of being on this film was that I got to perform Doug the dog. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please be my prisoner. Doug sprung out of, the very first thing he says is, my name is Doug. I have just met you, and I love you. And that pure, pure love from a dog is, I think that's, that's his key line. The goal when you see him on film is to want to just walk up to him and give him a big hug. He looks kind of like a golden retriever or a lab, or he's like kind of a mix. If you look at those breeds of dogs, they tend to be very puppy-like, and they love everybody. Golden Labs have such a joy for life, and they have no short-term memory. It's like they simply haven't remembered they've done it a hundred times before. A car ride, a tennis ball, or you open the door to the backyard. It's unbelievable. They go out and go, a garden! Oh, a hidden door! I've never found this door before. It's like they don't remember. They were only out in the garden last night. They just go absolutely over the top. I mean, they're, they're absolutely amazing dogs. I do! I do ever so want the ball! The dogs are all alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which sort of relates to their the caste system of who's the head. He doesn't even, you know, warrant that. He's just Doug. He doesn't even get like a zeta or a theta. The body language of dogs is different than the body language of people. A stereotypical dog who is not a happy dog, all joints are straight. So when you want to show scary, it's the dog he doesn't move. With Alpha, to communicate that he's the Alpha dog, we would do more restricted and reserved body movements and body language. Perhaps you desire to challenge the ranking that I have been assigned by my strength and cunning. An Alpha dog is a pretty cool customer, and he doesn't growl much, and um, he doesn't bark much, he doesn't fight much, because he doesn't need to. I mean, he's the top dog. Alpha, the Doberman, needed to feel like this, like the leader of the pack, some, a really scary, frightening dog, a dog you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. In the 60s, the Doberman had the role of, this is the aggressive dog. And, and he really looked the part, standing there like this, and those, his ears had been cut, so they formed little spikes sticking out of his head like two Kaiser helmets, you know, I mean, and, and the dog really struck a pose. And now in many countries around the world, you're not allowed to cut ears and tails off dogs. And so Dobermans have these dopey hang down ears and they just look the dopey clowns that they are. Really what he wants to communicate is, can't I just lay on the couch? The average shot with dogs was Carl and, and uh, Russell running and dogs chasing after them. The ground is very uneven and there's lots of obstacles like boulders and pillars. And we did quite a lot of research in reference to see what actual dogs do. In this park, we specifically wanted to have the dogs run over more and more hazardous terrain with bigger and bigger roles to try to get them to stagger. And we threw some tennis balls and uh, watched what they did. Usually, there's one dog out front who is following the scent, and then a close group of a dozen or so dogs will be following him. As you get farther behind, the pack fans out, and these dogs will be cutting the corners. If the scent trail turns, well, the dogs behind can see the turn, and they take the shortcut. And this is why a pack of dogs usually outruns its prey, because the prey has to run in a dead straight line to get away. You lost them? No, it was Doug. Yeah, he's with them. He helped them escape. Dogs are such incredibly social animals, and that's what uh, made them so easy to domesticate and makes them such marvelous companions. Doug! I was hiding under your porch because I love you. Can I stay? Doug, being a dog, has just infinite amounts of friendship and love, and uh, Doug gave that to Carl. Can you stay? Well, you're my dog, aren't you? And I'm your master. You are my master? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Good boy, Doug. You're a good boy. What's it like finding a character? I don't know. It's, uh, it seems like the greatest thing, really, in the world, right? I mean, you start with a seed of something, and you water it by, you know, testing it out, putting voices to it. Here, Snipey Snipey. Give it some sunlight by, you know, seeing what jobs that he does. An explorer is a friend 
to all, be a plants or fish or tiny mole. And Russell went through, I don't know, several years of really being developed. It was very organic. So I remember drawing skinny ones and chubby ones and really like the book smart kid or really shy kids and different types of kids that I remember from my youth. And then I drew a version of me as a kid at my dad's grocery store. Not that I was drawing me, but it was just the type that I was just trying to fill up of different shapes and stuff. Russell is a perfect wilderness explorer by the book. Are you in need of any assistance today, sir? No. But he just can't get it right. He is doing things that kids really do. He complains. He gets excited. I want to help! <laughs> he tries to help, but in trying to help, he does the opposite. He's got a gung-ho spirit of, let's go. Let's get out there. Let's go have an adventure. I've always wanted to try this. He was very comfortable being who he was. He didn't care about what others thought. And always overprepared for just about anything. Russell is kind of out, out on the side, but he's too uh, hopeful and energetic and uh, upbeat to notice. One of the things that we also wanted to, to understand about Russell is that maybe that's masking something. It's, it's always kind of like maybe there's, maybe there's a larger story underneath that. When we were looking for Russell's backstory, his, his motivation of why he wants to go along with Carl, uh, we wanted to just keep him kind of grounded. And in his case, what drives him forward is that his mom and dad have separated. His father has moved out and moved away and has very little contact with his son. And, you know, for us, this kid was always trying to achieve, even at a very young age. And, of course, our sort of uh, inroad to that was he's assisting the elderly batch. And once we had that idea, it was sort of like the kernel of that relationship. And for us, it was always a way of him compensating and him trying to make up and make better and make things work again. We were well aware that there have been plenty of stories in cinema, in literature, that have a kid missing a parent. but. We felt like it was a necessary thing. We wanted each character to have this kind of hole in themselves that the other can fill. It's tough to lose a, a parent, and there was a real vacuum for Russell. And it's all right here, this little, this little badge. There's something missing, this, you know, right over his heart. He thinks that somehow, when he gets that last badge, his dad's going to come, and the whole family's going to be together. In the same way that Carl feels like, if I get that house to the falls, my wife will be back. Both completely absurd. And yet, you can understand why they would think that. You know, it's emotionally, you want them to, you want to feel that. And I think everybody has their own kind of version of that, that somehow by accomplishing something, I'm gonna do something that's completely impossible. Russell is a good example of a place where your, the internal motivation of the character really affects their, their design. He became sort of this X shape that you felt that you had to kind of care for and try to nurture. In animation, it's all about silhouette and the outside form of the character. And so Russell it always had to be smooth and round. And on top of that, they're like, we want smooth and round, but he also has to be fun and he's a kid. So he would tuck his shirt in, but then he would be so excited about saluting that his shirt would pop out. Or he would look at the manual, take his neckerchief, spin it around, put it through the woggle, and make it as perfect as he can. But then throughout time, it just kind of gets offset. The character of Russell came out of really wanting to find a good foil for Carl, this stayed, locked in his ways type of guy. What is the worst thing an old man can have? A kid that has no slow button. I'll find the Mr. Fredrickson. Snipe. Here, Snipey, Snipey. And one of the people that influenced him heavily was Pete Sohn. There we go. It basically, Russell looks like a scaled down version of him. Pete had this wonderful openness and this great engaging quality. I just thought, wow, that would be great if we could capture that in this character and put that as an obstacle to this old man who's insistent on shutting the world out. This wilderness stuff is hard. The tent's a mess. The dinner turned out, well, you know. He's kind of built up this image of himself. And the fact that he can't build this tent, um, he just feels kind of dejected. And it has nothing to do really with his father or anything. You know, it's just a very simple emotion. The way Bob wrote it was this misunderstanding on Carl's part. You've been camping before, haven't you? Oh, uh, never outside. And so we wanted to make that much more uncomfortable and real than, uh, than if he had just said, well, my mom and dad are separated and blah, blah, blah. There again, trying to get to something. I don't think he would be happy to talk about that. So for me, the end is kind of rough still, so. 
Just look how cute she is. Oh, man. Kids are hard. Wait, aren't you super wilderness guy? With the GPMs and the badges? Initially, I just get that idea of what Russell's feeling throughout the shot. And then I work a lot with video reference of myself. Like, I'll just go into, we have an acting room in animation. And I'll just film myself acting like a kid. And just from that, I kind of extrapolate the things that feel true. Some of the little quirks, like maybe he's playing around with his fingers or, you know, he's kind of fidgety or he doesn't want to look at Carl. Things like that, that really get across the idea of him being uh, uncomfortable without, you know, uh, being too overt with it. Dan's animation in that scene, you know, here's a really cartoony egg-shaped model. And when you are looking at it, you're seeing very human acting. Well, why didn't you ask your dad how to build a tent? I don't think he wants to talk about this stuff. Well, why don't you try him sometime? Maybe he'll surprise you. Well, he's away a lot. I don't see him much. He's got to be home sometime. Well, I called, but Phyllis told me I bug him too much. Phyllis, you call your own mother by her first name? Um, great, man. There's some really incredible, truthfully observed moments in there that just feel really alive, you know? There's, like, kind of a naive... Uh, fun appeal to Russell's character that it doesn't feel staged. It feels like this kid really is there. So what do I say? You just say, whoa, hey, 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 look, Mr. Fredrickson, it likes me. When it came to casting the voice of Russell, one of the things that was really important for me was that it not sound like an actor kid. You know, there's so many times when you, you hear kids that are interested in being actors and they've been schooled in Broadway theater or whatever, and so they sound very energetic and peppy and, and phony, kind of. When I heard Jordan's reads, they were very much like a real kid would talk. Line one more time, it's a little complicated. Don't be afraid, little snipe. I am a wilderness explorer, so I am a friend to all of nature. Want some more? Great, now can you memorize it? We have some moments in the film where he's got to bear his soul, and so take some real acting. He, early on, wasn't really too excited about going to an imaginary place. He got a lot better as time went on. So we ended up having to trick him, in a way, keeping him off of what he's supposed to sound like, you know? So one idea was, on your marks, get set, go. Okay, now, before this next line, I want you to run back there, run around the foosball table three times, run as fast as you can, stop, and then say the line. I will feed him. I'll feed him, I'll give the food for him, I'll walk him, I'll change his newspapers, I will, uh... That was great. You know, when you cast the voice, the voice ends up influencing the character. And once you sort of embrace the actor that you've cast and fold that into the, the character of, that you're portraying on the screen, I think it becomes a stronger, more unique character. And that's what happened here with Russell. Russell, for assisting the elderly, and for performing above and beyond the call of duty, I would like to award you the highest honor I can bestow, the Ellie Badge. We probably did about 70 different versions of Kevin. That's just guessing, we did a lot. Almost too many to count, I've lost track at this point. The challenging thing about Kevin is that it was an imaginary bird. This bird doesn't really exist. There were so many areas and things that Kevin could be, and so the sky's the limit as far as what we can design. Kevin has been a lot of things in this movie. They're all attempts to answer the question, why has Muntz, this prominent uh, scientist, been after this thing for 50 years? What is so valuable about this bird that he's willing to devote the majority of his life to finding this thing? She was so many different layered ideas, it was really hard to figure out her design. We tried a, a thunderbird, like sort of a mythical creature at one point. We tried a golden bird that it's just pure gold, or at least looks like gold. I love the way the design turned out. It was a very difficult road getting there. I don't know what kind of bird Kevin is, actually. Kevin's a Kevin bird. Kind of looks like an ostrich, but it kind of looks like a parrot at the same time. What is that thing? 
It's a snake! A multicolored parrot ostrich. That looks kind of like a dinosaur. Get out of here! Or a big turkey. Kevin is actually a mix of at least a half a dozen, probably eight different sounds. All the comic stuff is, is sort of more bird-like. Some of the, the sort of purring, trilling stuff is, uh, is Pete, and then there's a little bit of me in there. The plaintive cries are hyena. So we ended up with a wide range of stuff that ended up being Kevin's voice. If you can somehow hook into the same thing that that Disney did in Swiss Family Robinson where they ride the ostrich. Like, what kid wouldn't want to ride an ostrich? In the past, you've heard about people riding ostriches, which is really mean, but <laughs> it's, it's, we needed something big enough for that, but goofy enough, and, and ostriches fit the bill. But we wanted elegance and grace. Whenever you have the physical presence of something, there, there's nothing beats that doing that reference. Having the ostrich come, just observing the behavior of this creature, looking at the physical traits of how it's walking, you know, you, I start as an animator getting into what are the muscles doing or what's the locomotion. The neck of an ostrich is pretty, pretty amazing. You know, they will be, they can put their head all the way down at their feet, all the way up in the air, and the neck very gradually rolls in this really sinuous and, and beautiful, intricate way all the way down something that's very hard to do in a computer. The ostriches look at you so almost blankly, but they're, you can tell something's going on behind there, but their expression just, you can't read it. Um, they were amazing, they're huge. I couldn't believe how big you know their, their feet were. Their feet were just, they really look like dinosaurs. Those are scary if you really get up close to them, and, but they're really goofy at the same time. I'm just no, kidding about the goofy comments. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ken's brain is uh, about as small as you can get. Pete described this once by saying, if you were to look inside of Kevin's head and listen to, it, to Kevin's thoughts, you'd hear a dial tone. We're supposed to treat her as though she's not the brightest creature in the jungle or Tapui. One of the challenging things was to figure out what his feathers were like. Pete wanted them to act like ostrich feathers that had that sort of loft so that when he walked, you know, there was this like dramatic bounce of the feathers, but then he wanted them iridescent too. Iridescence is a light response to these small microscopic structures. And you get specific colors of light get brighter and other specific colors go away. She had to be beautiful. She had to be a symbol of Muntz's insanity. She's the driving force behind all the character changes in the movie. Kevin is seen by Muntz as this ticket to fame, and if he can find this bird, he's going to be revered. Russell, as soon as he discovers this bird, takes it to heart like he needs to help this bird get back home, reconnect with the family, which is, of course, very central to Russell's character. For Carl, Kevin represents almost more of a reconnection with Ellie. Depending on who's looking at it, is seen in a very different way. I mean, you know, this was like building a real house, you know? It's like the measurements sort of had to all work. It has to be a house that believably feels sort of light that it could lift off into the sky. If it's all brick and stone, it might look cool, but it's got a weight to it that I, you might not believe quite as readily. We wanted the house to be small, sort of quaint, cozy. And then also, it feels maybe more threatened by all the construction, and it's just a little tiny house. The aesthetic we're going for is miniatures. We're trying to do it more like a, to look more like a stop motion miniature type of set. So it's not as if we made this house with a team of tiny carpenters. It's as if there's a big giant in there with a blunt pocket knife. So everything's a bit clumsy, a little bit imperfect. We made a physical model of the exterior of the house out of balsa wood, and um, I went in and I painted it. We thought of everything from the rafters to the roof to the bottom of the house. We knew that because it was going to be floating behind the characters, most of the time you'd be seeing the bottom. 
Every time I saw or anyone saw, you know, a house on stilt or a house that they're going to move, we took a lot of photos and it was always really haunted house, like with all these cobwebs and it always looked really dirty and really worse than, you know, it's too much. I think making those models was really helpful in getting the feeling across. We put actual practical lighting in the different rooms, and it was so amazing how you can get these feelings of lighting and cast shadows and just all this great information just from one light source shining in a window. And it felt like nighttime, like lonely nighttime old man house. We thought about how not only how humans age, but how, also how materials and houses age. It's our grandparents' houses. And very early on, we wanted to make sure Carl Fredrickson's house was very familiar. About 20 years ago, I went through my grandparents' house with a video camera, and I taped what all the rooms looked like, and it gave us an idea of maybe how Carl and Ellie's house could look. There should be sags in the stairs where he's walked the same path every day, and the interior of the house should be full of the knickknacks and debris of his life. There's also the emotional element of the whole house. The foyer of the house, most of the movie is in shadow, and we wanted to keep that in shadow. And the living room was most of the time in light and had a lot of blue and sunlight coming through, except for that period of Carl's lifetime where he was kind of sheltered and he, he shut down the, the shades. He's very reclusive, and we want the camera to reflect his, uh, his isolation and uh, his being trapped within his house. We frame Carl inside, inside doorways and things, squares within squares. Every day is the same. We make sure that, you know, from shot after shot after shot, the audience feel that Carl has really got trapped within that same environment. I really like the fact that we drag a, a house through the, half the film, or most of the film, is this, you know, house that's always there. It is not only a set, it actually comes to represent Ellie, who passes away. So her presence is felt through the whole film, uh, through that house. So it really has to represent the core of their relationship that Carl is trying to hold on to so desperately. And when he gets to the end of the journey, he realizes the house isn't her. You know, she's in here. She gave him the tools to connect and to move on. And in a way, it ends up being it ends up being an empty house because she's not in it. She's not the stuff. At that point, it's just a, a thing, you know? It's not necessarily Ellie. And, and when he lets go, it's so poignant. It's so like, you know, it's like a cathartic experience for him. And so, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty deep. <laughs> if Carl has a flying house, what would be something that you could give your villain would be a giant, massive airship. He doesn't do anything in a small way. He has a giant dirigible. <laughs> That's a subtle thing. <laughs> this, this thing is monstrous. When the house flies away, it's been a tricky balance of there have to be enough visual cues that hopefully convince the audience that this is really happening. Can I throw a wrench in all this? I just don't believe uh, a house could be lifted by this amount of <laughs> What we did was we kind of said, all right, in, in that regard, let's look at things that are a real life equivalent, like hot air balloons, you know, the ratio of the, the balloon canopy to the basket. There are 10,286 balloons, give or take a few. And in this case, what we do is animate all the balloons in the canopy in kind of a realistic way. The, the balloons actually are buoyant, and they are attached by strings, and the strings bounce off the other strings and other balloons, and the balloons all bounce off together, and it gives you kind of a really natural, realistic behavior for those balloons, which really helps, I think, the audience say, oh, you know what, I, I believe that. I buy that that house can float. The house steers by uh, this coffee grinder, which is tied to these ropes that are actually uh, attached to 
Upstairs is the weather vane. Yeah, it's controlled by chicken. <laughs> and then once the house is flying, Pete's direction was to have the house be a ship and kind of a sanctuary for Carl. And to not hear the balloon so much, but hear sort of just specific creaks. See? Cumulonimbus. There's a scene where the house is kind of, is kind of lost at sea and, and runs into a very threatening thunderstorm. And we wanted clouds that almost felt alive. So they are kind of the, the antagonist in that scene, and, and they, they roll and they animate in this very kind of menacing, menacing way, and they actually close in around the house. Well, the storm is kind of like this, this tumultuous portal. It's almost trying to show Carl. That was a very foolish idea you have here. <laughs> I don't think you thought this through. Your character, you know, who's a very homespun, small old man, is going to have to go against this massive machine. And Munce's dirigible is supposed to symbolize the glory of the lighter-than-air airships, that age of flight and that majesty and also that mystery. A dirigible is, by definition, either a semi-rigid or rigid airship. You could actually walk through them because there's a frame and then they fill pockets, they fill balloons within the framework. A blimp is just like a, a balloon. When it's deflated, it just collapses down into a, into a bag. It's a giant gas bag. You know, I always like to look at pictures of the blimps from the 30s and 40s. And we actually got to go up in a blimp. And I'll just never forget standing on the tarmac, this giant ship coming down at us. And once you got up there, it's really quiet, you know, and there's, there's not much engine noise and uh, you're in a blimp. <laughs> and it's just great because, you know, the captain has these controls which are still all very much cables and things like that. There's not too much high tech stuff in a blimp. There is a company uh, locally that's just by chance decided to start up dirigible rides. My family and got to ride in it. And it's a wonderful way to travel. Very pleasant. You can see why rich people, that was the way to travel. Very luxurious. You know, people had pianos in them and these opulent dining halls. And of course, that's what Munz has. This was one, one man's vision of what luxury and what adventure and what a dirigible would be. That feels really good. Yeah. What if he used, um, say, zebra? Uh, for, for the couch, for the cushions, for the chairs, mm -hmm. or had some element of the old hunter kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Our dirigible is based on real dirigibles, like the, the uh, Hindenburg. Queen of the skies, seen here from a universal newsreel camera plane as it sped over New York to its tragic end at Lakehurst, New Jersey. A roar and a burst of flame near the big tail fins turned the ship into a flaming inferno. Dirigibles back then, were dangerous and uh, very unpredictable. It was hard to fly them, and they had hydrogen in them. The dirigible is, is kind of Munz's mechanical expression of how lethal he is. It looks like a bomb. And uh, you know, it's pretty much like Munz himself, who's dangerous and, and, and unpredictable and could blow up at any moment. As you get deeper into the gondola of the dirigible, you're getting deeper and deeper into the psyche of Muntz. It's essentially a trip through Muntz's brain. And the deeper you get, kind of the darker it gets. And you realize, since he's been there for so long, just how far he's gone down the path of obsessing over this bird. Flight for him is adventure. This blimp is a platform of adventure. You go out into the world. And uh, at the beginning of the film, that's what it is. It's representative of him doing big things. Adventure is out there! It is this really nice blend of nostalgia, this desire to have this film feel like we felt as kids, this promise of the future, you know, like you ain't seen nothing yet kind of attitude. Ready? Ready! but just with one foot of, but remember, remember how it felt. And let's collide those things and see what we get. We came up with this idea of an old man floating away in his house with balloons. Something really grabbed us about that. 
Then we started thinking, okay, well, how did this old man get up in the floating house? What led him to float his house away? Why would someone do that? When we make these films, we try one thing, then we try another. But pretty early on, we came up with this idea of showing a life, you know, of them as kids all the way through when they're senior citizens. It's the crux of the film. If we don't get the audience to fall in love with Ellie and fall in love with the relationship and why he loves her so much, then you're not along for the ride of why Carl needs to do this. The very first incarnation of it on boards, we show when they're little and Carl's trying to trap this bird in a little homemade bird cage with a box and a stick. And as soon as he does, this girl comes out of nowhere and whacks him. It's like, you leave birds alone. Birds are nice, boys are dumb. And that starts off this long feud where they hide behind bushes and, you know, in order to leap out and punch each other. All through the years from when they're little kids, one would be eating in the cafeteria and a punch would come in. And then someone opens their locker and a punch comes out. So instead of seeing them sweetly grow old, they basically punch themselves old, even into old age. And even when Ellie's sick at the end, she punches Carl. And we thought that was the funniest thing. And we showed it and there was silence and people were sort of shocked, I think, by the, I guess they thought it was too violent or something. Of course, the reason to have the punching contest to begin with was to be charming, to let you watch these characters fall in love in a sort of non-sappy, untraditional way. You know, you don't talk very much. I like you. In Bob's rewrite, you felt that same sense of connection that you did uh, in a much quicker way. I grew up, my parents took um, Super 8 films of us. And looking at them, there's something almost more emotional to me than videotape where you have sound and picture. When it came to do this sequence, I thought, well, let's go for it. Let's go for broken, pull everything out and just have music and the visuals so we're not trying to place you in the scene. It's almost like watching an old Super 8. Married life is kind of designed to look like a lot of our own lives. You meet the girl in love, you get married, you have a house. Ah, oh, there's challenges in life. It's like, you know, the roof gets broken. There's not a lot of money. Also, it means that there's not enough funds to actually go do lots of things. Most of our dreams you kind of set aside. There's no dialogue and just these little mini moments putting up the ties, the mundane adventures that they're on dancing to candlelight. We weren't afraid to show an actual life with its ups and downs. And you really feel, I think, for Carl, uh, you understand why he's going on this journey. And that's, that's all we can ask for for these sequences, is that you're in Carl's shoes and you care for him. So the scene you're about to see is the actual storyboarded version, an earlier storyboarded version of Married Life that picks up right after the punching contest. Carl is waiting in the bushes to get Ellie back. Thank you.
<laughs> hey, Doug, what do these do, boy? You didn't file your paperwork huh? last night. Don't let it happen again. Hey, stop. Oh, I would be happy if you stopped. <gasps> Let's watch some of the moving pictures. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Oh. oh. <laughs> Roar! That was a Bengal tiger. I did that one to get my animal calling badge. That's great, Russell. I'm really good. Ah, here! Guess what that one was? Annoying? No, the puma. I know all kinds of calls. <laughs> Hee haw! Bob White? Bob White? <laughs> What was that one? That actually sounded pretty good. That wasn't me. You got a runaway in terror badge? No. Time to earn it! Fredrickson? Oh, nothing, Russell. Scraped my knuckle. Uh-oh, that looks like a snake bite! Whoa, it's tiny. Only needs a small bandage. <gasps> I have those! To apply bandage, remove adhesive backing and apply over a wound area. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Better hurry, Russell. Time is healing this wound. I'm blind! Oh, hold still. On three. One, two. Russell, what are you doing? I'm making an official wilderness explorer snipe trap. And as soon as a snipe steps right... Whoa! Help! <sighs> Thanks again for saving my life, Mr. Fredrickson. And now for the perfect snipe bait. No animal in the entire universe can resist chocolate. Whoa! Help! It looks so... Chocolatey. Russell, if you... Maybe if I'm really quick. No, wait, wait! <laughs> oh. You want some? Oh boy! 
Uh-oh. 